there's no need for any more of this conversation. So thank you for being here. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, so our main speaker today is no stranger to the Oasis community. Uh, Brian Schrock is the president of the board of Galveston Bay Oasis and a community leader for the Oasis Gaming Virtual Chapter. Uh, he is a geoscientist by education, a certified Texas mat master naturalist, and works as a GIS analyst for the city of Houston's stormwater maintenance branch. Today, he'll be talking about how Oasis can get involved in iNaturalist and about the City Nature Challenge coming at the end of April this year. So with that, Help me welcome Brian to the screen. All right. <clears throat> well, hey, everybody. Hope you all can hear me. Let me uh, let's see. All right. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be going over, uh, like Alexa said, iNaturalist and the upcoming City Nature Challenge. Um, so let me go ahead and pull up my presentation here. There we go. That looks good. All right. Um, yeah, I really miss you guys. I hope you're all doing well. Um, I'm really thankful to get to speak with everybody today. Uh, and so today we're going to be talking about easily one of my favorite citizen science initiatives that's ever been done. Um, when I started hearing the words citizen science, uh, you know, probably about like 10 years ago or so, when I started hearing it used more often, um, 
I think often what I pictured and what was commonplace were things like, um, you know, folks who have a weather station in their yard, they contribute to citizen science by sending their local weather data to a big network of weather stations across the country. Or amateur astronomers spotting objects in the night sky and reporting them. Uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff to me is what citizen science was, and it all sounded really cool, but it was also quite expensive. You needed special tools for it. You needed to either buy a weather station, buy a telescope. Um, it's, it is citizen science, but it's kind of citizen science only for the hobbyists who can afford to do it. So that brings me to iNaturalist. Um, iNaturalist is an app. Uh, so it, it's kind of a combination of a phone app and a web app. Uh, they have a website as well. So it, it began at uh, the University of California in Berkeley. And it was a master's project by a, a, about three students there in the School of Information. Uh, they put it together in 2008 and uh, afterwards kind of kept working on it and developing it into the app it is today. Um, and, and their idea was to make something that uh, could basically take a picture of something you saw in nature and help you identify it. Um, you know, so it, it's like one of those smart learning systems where the more it sees of a picture of a certain animal, the better it gets at recognizing it. It's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a growing technology. And uh, it became a way to not only just identify things, but make these observations of species you see out in nature and share them with the greater community of biologists, naturalists, entomologists, you know, botanists, um, so let me show you real quick. This is kind of what the phone app looks like. If you were to have iNaturalist on your phone, and some of you might already have it on there, uh, it's, it, it is growing in popularity. But this is kind of what your home screen would look like. You'll see a, a little grid here or a list of observations you've made, uh, usually sorted from your newest ones at the top down below. And you'll see three tabs up there. We've got observations, species, and identifications. Uh, observations is kind of the one I'm going to focus on mostly today. And, and this is the basics of uploading something you've seen as an observation. Uh, you can also see all the different species you've looked at here. And you can see all the identifications you've helped other people make. Um, but again, we're going to focus mostly on that first one. So let's say you go to the park and you're walking, you see these adorable looking little ducks. Uh, you might know what species they are already, or maybe you have absolutely no idea. But either way, this is an observation. So you take a picture. And if we go back to that app, you'll see down in that bottom right corner, you've got your little green circle with the plus sign in it. Uh, this is what you hit to submit an observation. And that will pull this up. So you will see uh, a list of things that will fill in here. Now, if you're using your cell phone, it's likely you probably have your location services on or at least enabled. Um, for this app in particular, it's gonna need that enabled in order to pull that latitude and longitude that you see down there. And uh, you know, your phone, when it takes pictures, it also gives it a timestamp and a date. So that will also automatically fill in. And those are both really important for an observation to be of good quality. You want it to have a time, a date, and a place. And you'll see you also have an area to put in notes. Um, this isn't completely necessary to use, but if there was anything interesting about this observation, like you wanted to say, I saw four of them together, you know, it looked like they were eating this, it looked like they were, you know, uh, they had just landed here, they flew in from the north. You can, you can describe that stuff. Um, and then at the, uh, at the bottom there, you have uh, that the location is open. That just means that you've made this uh, location public. So if you're at a park and you take a picture and you upload it, uh, everybody will see that that picture was taken at that park. 
Uh, you can always set location to private, which will usually set up a buffer of, you know, about 400, uh, 500 feet, maybe sometimes a little bit more. So this is just kind of in case you've been taking a lot of observations at your house and maybe you don't want to see, you don't want people to see that you've seen these ducks in your own backyard. Uh, so in general, I always keep my location open. Um, even when I do uh, things seen in my yard, I'm not too worried about you know, whatever uh, someone can do with that information. I'm not sure, but um, I haven't had any issues yet. But uh, you'll have a question of, is it captive or cultivated? This is important if you're <clears throat> taking a picture of you know, something that you planted in your own yard uh, that is not a wild plant, it didn't get there, by natural means, it is a cultivated plant. Or if this is your pet duck, it's a captive duck. This is not one that is in the wild. Uh, we can talk about projects a little bit later, um, but at the top there, you see we'd still have to fill in this question of what did you see? And you'll have an opportunity to either, you know, if you know that these are black-bellied whistling ducks, you can say, I saw black-bellied whistling ducks, and that will come up in the search menu. But it will also, before you even type anything in, it will try to guess for you. And this technology was able to identify, you can see here it says, we're pretty sure it's in the genus Dendrocygna, which is the whistling ducks. And then it gives you some of the species that might be within that genus. And just, you know, that it certainly looks like that black-bellied whistling duck, so that's the one we select. And before you know it, uh, other people, other user, users of the site, they're jumping in to help you identify uh, what you saw. So it's almost like a, a, a second thumbs up or a third thumbs up of people saying, yep, that is a black-bellied whistling duck. And this is important because the oftentimes people will upload something, they won't know what it is for sure, and you will get folks coming in with their own suggestions and before you know it, you have, you know, a few wrong identifications or ones that are almost controversial. Like someone's like, no, no, it's not that bird. It is, you know, the white-bellied whistling duck or it's, um, yeah, basically you, you need a consensus. And so the app kind of waits to see that you have um, at least two thirds of people chiming in have agreed that it is a certain species uh, before it it calls it research grade. And that that's kind of an arbitrary uh, thing that the app developers made. It doesn't particularly mean anything scientific, but it's just a way for them to say, this is a good quality observation. It had a time, a date, and most people agree it is this species. And you know, a lot of these users are people who are botanists, um, especially the people identifying. They are botanists, they're entomologists, uh, biologists. Uh, it's a good mix of people from different backgrounds, but it, uh, it is also just a lot of hobbyists. You have birders in here, you have just people who downloaded the app because someone said, yeah, that'll tell you what plant you have in your backyard. Um, but that, that is, again, why you want the two thirds uh, consensus on your identifications. Now, to do this, um, you know, a lot of people will bring their phone with them in the field. They'll take these pictures while they're at the park. They'll upload them on the spot, um, and that that's great. Uh, I I do that frequently, but it also is one of those apps where the more you're doing this, the more you're taking pictures, the more you're uploading, you're going to start draining your phone battery. And when you're out in the field or enjoying a day at the park or you need to eventually navigate back home, the last thing you want is to be draining your phone battery or you know, running up the amount of data you're consuming. So luckily the app works great where you can take the pictures and then upload them later when you're connected to Wi-Fi. Um, but you also have the option, if, especially if you don't particularly like taking pictures on your phone, you can bring your camera with you and go to iNaturalist's homepage. Uh, this is what their homepage looks like, and that red arrow is pointing to the upload button. So if you log into your account, this is what you see. Uh, you can see I actually have a feed there that shows observations made uh, by some of the people I follow and at some of the locations I follow, like Armin Bayou Nature Center. 
Um, so yeah, here on your homepage, you go up to upload, and this is where if you have a you know a point and shoot camera and it is full of a hundred pictures from your day hiking at Armin Bayou Nature Center, you can dump all these pictures into here in bulk, sort them, uh, combine any of them that are the same species or the same observation. And one by one, you can just identify them all, give them all location and upload all of them at once. Uh, this is this tends to be what I do more often because I, I started bringing a nicer camera in the field so I could get some better shots of birds. Uh, but either way, um, whether you do it by phone or you do it later at home, uh, you can you can make your observations and they'll come out the same. And you will see them on your phone app if you uploaded them on the web. And you'll see them on the web if you uploaded them on the phone app. So let's go back to that black-bellied whistling duck. One of the great things that's being captured, again, with all this data is you know the location, the time of year you saw it. And with that data, the iNaturalist website can show you things like this graph of seasonality. Like most people are seeing this duck in April. Uh, it might just be that's when they are out you know, in public more often, if they've just had, you know, ducklings, maybe they are, <clears throat> uh, you know, out feeding more frequently. So you, you can kind of see that certain species have a seasonality to them. Um, you can see like who's identifying these the most. There's also a map you can look at to see where these observations are being made. So you can see here, they're actually quite common on in Texas, on the Gulf Coast, in Mexico. Uh, down near El Salvador and parts of Venezuela and Colombia, even all the way down to it looks like Argentina. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of uh, their range. In fact, the red layer on this map is showing what officially was given as their native range, but you can see there are cases where these have been seen outside of that range. Um, so there's a lot to learn uh, with this kind of data. And you can explore all of this stuff uh, with the web app. Uh, the phone app is a little more limited on what you can see in the data, but uh, if you go to their web page and you log in, you'll be able to explore all this stuff. Um, of course, you know, practice good observation techniques. If you go into the, the field, please don't, you know, stalk and harass any animals that you're trying to observe. Um, you know, be careful what you touch. This person uploaded what they thought was box elder. Someone chimed in and said, no, that is definitely not box elder. That is poison ivy that you are holding right there. Um, you know, if you want to take a picture of a plant, you don't know what it is, you know, just carry a white piece of paper with, in your pocket. You can put it behind it. It gives it a better picture. You don't have to touch it. Um, and I would say another tip too, when you're making these observations is you don't want to just take a picture of a tree from a distance, for instance, you wanna get a picture of the whole tree, maybe a picture of the bark, a picture of any flowers on it, a picture of the top of the leaf, the bottom of the leaf. Um, you know, some people do, they just upload a picture of a tree and some trees you can for sure say, yeah, that's a bald cypress. I can tell from a, like a hundred feet away that that's a bald cypress. But for some trees, especially ones that have similar species, uh, sometimes the difference is just like a little, a small detail on the bottom of a leaf that will tell you whether this is, you know, the Western species or the Eastern species. Um, so generally, the more detailed your observations, the better. And uh, I, I kind of want to share this. This is one of my favorite stories from iNaturalist. Uh, this was an observation of an emerald ash borer. You might be familiar with this species. It is a very destructive beetle that um, has been uh, spreading throughout the United States and is a huge risk to a lot of ash trees um, throughout the country. Uh, they do a significant amount of damage to them. And this observation was made actually four years ago exactly on March 28th, 2017. Uh, and at the time it was made by a 10 year old uh, username, Sammy James. He lived up in the Fort Worth area. Uh, he saw this beetle in his driveway, took three pictures of it, uploaded it. And before you knew it, uh, scientists spotted it on iNaturalist. Uh, Texas A&M wrote an article about it. 
they had scientists coming out to look all around his neighborhood uh, for any more signs of these beetles. And he became one of the first people to identify the species in Texas and only 10 years old. And he was able to do this. Um, you know, I, I've been using this app for many years, uh, probably about since 2016. And uh, it, it feels good to sometimes be the first person to see a species in your county. Um, it's getting harder to do these days because there's a lot more people using the app. Uh, but it, it's amazing to see the science in action. Like if you go to this guy's observation uh, on the web, you will see dozens of comments of scientists saying, can you confirm where this is? You know, should we go out there? They're tagging other scientists saying, I need your secondary opinion on this. What do you see? What do you think? Um, it, it, it's really, really cool that, you know, a 10 year old could spark this, this kind of scientific discovery. Um, another instance more recently, uh, you might recognize this beautiful, uh, I, I believe it's a moth, it's, it might be, <laughs> It's called the spotted lanternfly. It's uh, a species from Asia that had, was introduced into the Philadelphia area by accident a few years ago. And it's been recorded in that area, uh, damaging a lot of trees. They, they uh, breed into very large uh, populations. They, they tend to suck sap out of trees and leaves and they make lots of little holes that introduce disease to the trees and it it's basically become a, a, a serious issue up there um, because it has the potential to affect um, grape production because grape vines are one of their preferred uh, meals as well as uh, a number of different trees that are part of the lumber industry um, so uh, fruit trees as well. There's a number of fruit trees that the species is recorded as damaging. Uh, yeah, it's known as Lycorma delicatula, uh, the spotted lanternfly. And I wanted to show you this. So this first observation was made in 2016. You can see that little tiny orange dot kind of just between Allentown, Philadelphia, and Lancaster. Um, and if you skip ahead year by year, here was by 2017, these were the observations on iNaturalist. By 2018, the user observations uh, was expanding. 2019, 2020. Uh, yeah, so we are now seeing the species not only in the Philadelphia area, but in New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland. Uh, it's hopped across the Appalachians in Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh. Uh, it's been found up in Boston, and as recently um, as the last few months, uh, these deceased species were found in the Detroit area. Um, the person who uploaded these was actually, I think, working in a sh shipping yard and found these on a pallet. Um, <clears throat> so uh, his observation, again, caught a lot of attention because this was a significant further east discovery than uh, they'd had in the past. So um, this kind of stuff is really, really critical, this kind of science, especially for tracking invasive species. And uh, within a few days of his upload, there was this immediate release from the Department of Agriculture in Michigan explaining what was found, um, asking for anybody else to send evidence that this species had been found locally. Uh, so you can, you can kind of see just how much the citizen science here is actually working with the scientists behind the scenes. And so that brings me to the second part of my talk. Um, there's a, what I would like to call the Super Bowl of the natural world, our yearly city nature challenge. Uh, every, at the end of April, every year around Earth Day, iNaturalist hosts a competition called the City Nature Challenge where they ask cities at this point around the world to go out, take as many observations as possible over a weekend and upload them. And it becomes a big race to see uh, which species can identify the most species, um, which, city, excuse me, which cities can get the most observers and 
uh, which cities can get the most species. And honestly, the one most people care about is the category of the most species. So this is the kind of the, this is like the real gold medal you want. And the first time this nature challenge was uh, done, this was back when iNaturalist was still quite young. It was the City Nature Challenge in 2016 was kind of started as a friendly competition between San Francisco and Los Angeles to see which city could identify the most species. I actually don't remember who won this one. Um, I want to say it was San Francisco. Uh, but you can see they made 21,642 observations in a weekend of 2,864 species, and they had 1,083 people participate. By 2017, uh, 16 cities in the USA participated, including Houston. And that year, we actually, Houston won the most species observed category. Uh, by 2018, 69 cities across the globe took place. Uh, I believe by 2018, San Francisco came in first. And then in 2019, 159 cities across six continents took place. Um, and in that one, Cape Town, South Africa uh, recorded the most species. In 2020, the competition uh, went a little differently. Uh, of course, being held at the end of April meant that we were sort of in the height of uh, coronavirus. And the hosts of the event said, you know what, instead of making this a competition, let's just have a, a friendly challenge to everybody to go out together, take as many observations as you can across the world, and it'll be a team effort. So technically, uh, there was no winner in 2020. That said, uh, the Bayou City did find the most species again that year, overtaking Cape Town, Hong Kong, and San Francisco. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of had to do it, take one for the team and uh, not take our gold medal, but we all know we actually did win. And if, this was a competition of 244 cities that took place that year. So next month, we are looking at City Nature Challenge 2021. It's going to be from April 30th to May 3rd. And uh, I encourage you to write that down. Be ready to participate. Uh, I'd really like to see Houston again win as the city with the most species. One of the advantages we have in this is Houston is um, kind of at an intersection of multiple biomes. You've got the Katy Prairie to our west, uh, the Gulf Coast Prairie to our south and southeast. We've got um, Galveston Bay. We've got the ocean, uh, multiple bayous. We've got the Piney Woods just the north of us. Um, and we're a major migratory route. A lot of birds follow the Texas coast on their way back down south or, or up north. Um, so. I really like see, seeing city, uh, excuse me, seeing Houston take first in the City Nature Challenge. Um, I'd love to see us do that again this year, and for that, I am going to need y'all's help. Um, and one of the big reasons that all cities are trying to do this, um, you know, a lot of the folks involved uh, getting these off the ground locally are museums, their groups like the Native Plant Society or the Master Naturalists. Uh, the, the conservancies located around the city, um, they drive a lot of these city nature challenges and make the push to get people out. Um, in particular, uh, being in a city, this means that, you know, we have a limited green space and in many cases we're losing a lot of it. Uh, we have kids growing up in cities that don't have a natural setting around them. They might have, you know, a little pocket park in their neighborhood uh, you know, it probably just has some St. Augustine grass, uh, jungle gym, but, you know, it, it probably doesn't have a native swamp setting. It might not have a native prairie setting. They're probably not observing too many snakes or gators, insects, bugs at these parks. Um, and so we really do need to encourage our young people to get out and participate in these kinds of things. 
And uh, as I say here, you know, by participating in the City Nature Challenge, not only are you learning more about your local nature, but you can make your city a better place for you and other species. Um, the only way you're going to grow up caring about the environment is if you're out in it. Uh, you need to grow up around nature. You need to appreciate it. Uh, you need to get out in it. How else are you going to know that it's worth saving? So Oasis, um, here's kind of the final thing I want to leave you all with. Uh, aside from just participating in the City Nature Challenge, which I encourage you to do, um, you know, whether you're tuning in today from Houston uh, or whether you're watching from your own region of the world or participating in your own city, um, you know, I wish you a very sporting, may the best of naturalists win. Um, but I do have somewhat of a bigger vision of how we can get involved. Uh, so welcome to the Oasis Network on iNaturalist. Um, I spoke with a few other Oasins uh, who also happen to be iNaturalist users. Uh, and I built this project on iNaturalist. So what you're seeing here are five Oasins who have made observations uh, wherever they live. We have a few people from the Houston area on here. Uh, we have someone uh, from Tennessee who's part of our Oasis gaming community. And we've been uploading our observations and collecting them uh, here at the Oasis Network. And the way I've done that is I set this project anytime it sees someone with an Oasis username uh, to record their observations under the team Oasis uh, iNaturalist project. And in order to get involved with this, uh, all, you, all you will need to do is if you have an iNaturalist account or you're going to make one, is to send me your username and I can load you into our Team Oasis group. And I will have some details on that for you in a minute. Um, you know, with this data, we'll actually be able to see uh, all the different places that OASINs have uh, made observations. So you can see here uh, on my map, we've filled in quite a bit of Texas, a lot of the Eastern US, um, and our OASIS friend, Emily, has made two observations in India. So India is now on our map. Uh, one day I dream of OASINs just filling in this whole thing. Um, you know, as a community that has participated in the March for Science, uh, that believes meaning comes from making a difference. Uh, you know, I really want to see OASINs getting involved in a citizen science project that is not only accessible to everybody, um, but it's something that we can do uh, together to help science, to help research, to help the natural world around us. And, uh, you know, and have a lot of fun doing it. When I started doing this stuff, almost all the species I've uploaded, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what they were. And I've only learned them mostly from doing iNaturalist. I go out in the field, I see something I don't know, I take a picture, and from that point on, I learn to recognize it. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, it's crazy how much you know about bugs or about grass or about trees and it's, you know, it wasn't hard. It really wasn't. I didn't go to school for this kind of stuff. My background is in rocks, uh, earth science. Um, but, you know, with t a tool like this in your pocket, um, you really can learn this stuff for free. Uh, and, and I highly encourage you to get involved with it, to, to learn this stuff on your own. Um, so that said, here again is the information for Team Oasis on iNaturalist. Uh, you can join by uh, sending an email to me. And I'll, I'll post this in the Houston Oasis private group as well. Um, but I have an Oasis email. It's just brian.schrock at oasisnetwork.com. So once you've made an iNaturalist account, or if you already have one, send me that username. And I will tell the project to look for any observations you make and put them in our Oasis observation project. Um, and I know, you know, a number of you are friends with me on Facebook. You can feel free to message me there. Or if you're any of the Oasis gamers tuning into this today, you know who I am on the SOAR or on the uh, Discord server, Sonorbi. 
Um, so yeah, I, I guess at this point, um, I suppose we're going to break and come back for questions. But uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in, for hearing this talk. Um, I'm excited to see what you guys observe. Um, I'm going to be looking for all kinds of rare, or endangered, or threatened species, or you know, just the things you see in your backyard. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll turn it back to uh, Abhishek and Alexis and let them take it from here. All right, thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, we're um, going to take about a 10-minute uh, break, uh, do some breakout sessions, uh, get let people have a chance to talk to each other. Um, this is also a great chance for if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, you can ask your questions in the chat there, and we can get them over to Brian here in Zoom. Um, yeah, um, this is also a chance uh, uh, to email Brian wanting to add on, or if you already have an iNaturalist account, uh, you can search for the Oasis group on iNaturalist and ask to join from there too, because mm -hmm. that's what I did when I first heard about Brian's talk. Um, or go out to your backyard and upload a picture of a bumblebee like I did. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we'll take a 10 minute break and be back for Q&A in a little bit. Thanks.
All right, welcome back. Hopefully everyone had a good uh, break. We were talking about a lot of the different animals that we've seen just around the Houston area and everything. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and get started with some Q&A. Um, first question from Karen, do we need to register for the City Nature Challenge? Uh, no, actually, the nice thing about the City Nature Challenge is uh, each geographic area participating has been kind of drawn on a map so that if you upload a species and you're within that geographic boundary, it automatically counts. So if you make five observations in Galveston County, it's going to go to Team Houston. Uh, so Houston's team is Harris County and then the I think like six or seven that border us. Uh, kind of the same with Dallas Fort Worth or Amarillo. If you were to go up there during the City Nature Challenge and make an observation, it would count if it was within their boundary. Um, so luckily, you, there's nothing you have to worry about other than just going out and uploading during those or that weekend. Here in the Houston area, because we want to win, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that answers uh, Gretchen's question that uh, if Missouri City would be considered part of the Houston Galveston area. Mm -hmm. right. Awesome. Uh, next question from Roger B. As far as you know, what is the invasive species that we have to be most worried about in the Houston area? Uh, honestly, the one that's already here, I mean, there's a number that are here now, but one of the big ones that I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with is the Chinese tallow tree. Um, Houston overwhelmingly you know despite our our coastal nature and having the piney woods nearby us the majority of our area is tall grass prairie technically um it might not seem like that anymore because you drive around and you see like lots of wooded areas but a lot of those woods are dominated by chinese tallow and there are species that most insects don't care for most birds don't particularly care for um, so they they don't offer really a benefit, but they end up shading out a lot of our native species um, and cause a decline in some of our other plants that are crucial. Um, but as far as, you know, of course, you have the fire ant, you have um, the Muscovy ducks that are at a lot of parks. Um, but those those ones I discussed earlier, you know, there are fears that emerald ash borer could come down this way. Uh, I think everybody's still trying to figure out how far that spotted lanternfly might go. Um, there's a huge fear that if it makes it to California, it could ruin grape crops there. And of course, you know, we have wine growing in Texas and uh, near the Austin, San Antonio area. So there's a lot to be concerned about um, with anything that comes in. And being able to track it down fast is important. Uh, one question that kind of ties into this, uh, are they tracking the murder hornets with iNaturalist? You know, every time I see those pop up, I actually go immediately to iNaturalist and try and search it. And as of yet, I have not seen any in the U.S., but I guess it's been a few months since I've checked. And uh, um, yeah, but I have my eye on it because I'm going to be curious if someone actually uploads one. Um. Is there any attempt to use this data for population estimates? There were nothing about numbers uh, when you showed your screen. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I would assume at some point um, there might be some issues with that kind of thing, mostly because most users, depending on what region you're in, will be most active during a certain time of year. Uh, like, you know, in Houston, we, in the middle of summer, we might not be outside as much observing things. Whereas, you know, in Alaska, everything's covered in snow for a good portion of the winter. Um, so I, I'm sure you can do some studies with it, you know, at least if you kind of know how to account for those things. Um, but I think in particular, it might be a little difficult until that, you know, that can be kind of perfected. I would say, but I, I'd be curious to know. I, I know more and more uh, groups are using it. I, I know two years ago, I took a picture of an insect I hadn't seen before in my mom's backyard. And I had a guy from 
uh, he was a professor from a school near San Antonio, asked me to put it in my freezer and then he would send me a package so I could mail it to him. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, you know, uh, there's stuff being done, but I, I couldn't tell you exactly how big of an impact it has right now, and uh, at least with population studies. Um, question from Nancy on Facebook. Do you advocate for people to concentrate on one group or going all over the map? Uh, it, also, it may be good for enhancing species numbers if people would specialize in groups that are normally missed, like uh, bryophytes or microscopic aquatic organisms, etc. cetera. Uh, it doesn't do much good to take pictures of squirrels or cardinals or oak trees, for example. Right. Um, I mean, I, I still, like if I go to a park, I will still take a picture of every living thing I see usually, um, even the squirrels, even the ducks. I just like to, to record that they were there. Um, mm -hmm. But there are people who specifically use it for, you know, some, sometimes it's a grad student that has logged on and made an account and uh, they might not actually be uploading as much, but they are identifying. So they get on there, like anytime I upload a tree hopper, which is like a little tiny species of bug that uh, frequents trees, there's a guy whose username is like Hopper John and like all he does is identify tree hoppers. So, um, so he's always like one of the first people to identify my species. And uh, I know there's another guy who lives in the Clear Lake area who takes water samples at Exploration Green and he actually uploads through his microscope um, anything he sees in there. Uh, so yeah, and, and of course you have the people who are just, they're birders through and through, they're there to see birds, they don't really care about the plants, so they're not that interested in the bugs. Um, and, and in fact, if you upload a bird to iNaturalist, you generally get a response back with, within the hour of what it is because people really like identifying the birds. Um, sometimes, sometimes I upload plants and it can be a long time before someone comes in to help um, confirm the ID. Uh, but yeah, there are neat areas, and I know when the competition comes around, uh, they encourage some groups, you know, like they'll talk to folks on Galveston Island and be like, you know, see if you can go to the beach. Last year, we didn't have a lot of beach submissions. We want to see what kind of life you're finding there. Um, so yeah, and I, and I know it's a little hard right now with um, the pandemic still ongoing, but uh, in years past, usually different groups like Armin Bayou or Katie Prairie would actually host events and say, we're all gonna be doing a bio blitz for iNaturalist, you know, come out, we're gonna look at this location. And so they'll sweep through Katie Prairie looking for stuff. All right, uh, another question. Um, for the competition, there's no need to identify what you take the pictures of, correct? Cur uh, sort of. So. If you just want to take pictures and upload, that's fine. Um, usually there will be people who are strictly on there to help identify things. So uh, when it comes to the competition, you know, you go out, take your pictures, make your observations. I would say always try and at least get them close. Like if you, like with the duck earlier, if you took a picture of a duck, you don't know the species, you can just type duck and it'll suggest like the mallard family or this family. And you say, you know what, it's at least that I think I know it's a duck and then people will narrow it down because what will count towards that species count is getting it to the species level. Um, so if you see a butterfly, you can put it in the, you know, butterfly order, but it need, it'll eventually need to be get gotten down to the species ID and there will be people helping with that. Um, but as much as you can do on your own, I would say do. And the app is free on um, for iOS and Apple. Yep. Yeah, it's on Android, iOS. Um, and of course, you can get it on a web browser as well. Uh, another question from Paige. Uh, are you familiar with the Harris County Stormwater Qualities Storm Drain Stenciling Program? And if so, does it still exist? And how do we get the stencils? Uh, so. I'm assuming that question is because I work for stormwater maintenance. So my side is the engineering side. Uh, I'm not as familiar with the people who do the stormwater quality testing, um, but I hope they're still doing it. I, I appreciate seeing the stencils out there. Um, but uh, as far as I know, I, I would say the program is probably ongoing, but 
I can't say for sure. Lou mentions that the Merlin app can help you identify birds as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I know a lot of people use Merlin, and th there's a number of apps out there that are kind of there to help you identify things. Like I, I couldn't name them all, but there are ones sometimes that are just particular to plants or flowers. Um, but what I like about iNaturalist is it's the most friendly with scientists and it's the most widely used, um, it seems, by scientists. Merlin is used a lot by birders in particular, um, and it is great. Uh, but um, you know, iNaturalist can also do birds as well. So I, I think if you're uploading to Merlin, still do it, but maybe also consider uploading those same pictures to iNaturalist. Question from Ted, what is your favorite leaf identifier? I still use iNaturalist for that. Um, that was actually why I first downloaded it. I saw a plant when I was, um, I wanna say like near uh, Matagorda, I went to one of the nature centers out there and right along the ship, um, the uh, intercoastal waterway, I saw this plant that ended up being um, a type of camphor weed, but I, I didn't know what it was. It was really pretty though. So I took a picture of it and was able to identify it that way. But um, especially with plants, like I said, get the picture of the top of the leaf, bottom of the leaf, any flowers, any bark, color of the stem. With plants in particular, those are the ones that tend to require the most detail. Like with a butterfly, they almost all have different patterns. Same with birds. Um, but there are just like plants in particular, the species identification can be so, so small between two species. So it's good to get detail. Um, question from Linda, do any of those species interfere with drinking water and environments that affect humans? I think she means perhaps the microscopic species. Um, I mean, there's always that risk if you're in untreated water. So uh, yeah, always be safe when you're doing this, by the way. Remember, don't touch the poison ivy. Don't taste the water. You don't need to do that for your, your uploads. Um, but yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to answer that question more specifically. All right. I'm not seeing any more questions. If I missed anyone, feel free to raise your hand. But do we have anyone who wants to ask a question? Bob, are you raising your hand? Or is that just... <laughs> All right. Yeah, I see somebody mentioned that the those tuning in from Nairobi, Kenya uh, are here today. Um, if you have the app and you want to upload our first observations in Kenya, please do. I would love to see that. All right. Do we have any more questions? If you do, you can uh, also unmute yourself and, and ask your question directly to Brian if you'd like. All right, I think that is it. I'm not seeing any more on Facebook either. All right, well, thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, oh, wait, Ted. Thank you. Oh, no, he's waiting, okay. <laughs> wait, do you have a question, Ted? Oh, okay. Go ahead and unmute, Ted. Thank you, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if, if Brian had seen that one app. I've seen it before. I think my brother Richard found it originally. And uh, where you, you take a, a leaf and you take a picture of the leaf, say a plan view, and then the app would give you a, a list of possible uh, identifications for it, you know, which is yeah, kind of neat. That, and, that's what this app does. Mm -hmm. What, iNaturalist does that? Yeah, yeah. So you, you can manually enter in what you think it is, but it also uses that that smart learning to look at the leaf and you know it looks at the distance between the veins, oh. looks for any lobes, and it identifies it as well. I see, because yeah. I, I well I just uploaded uh, a weed uh, about a week ago, but it was pretty pretty crappy uh, picture really because uh, by the time I decided to. Uh, Take a picture of it i'd already pulled all the weeds out and all i had was one of these ones that I'd already pulled out but uh no one's identified it yet but like you say sometimes it takes a while for 
an ID to come back. But I guess if, if I had just taken a picture, if I take a picture of one leaf plan view and put that into iNaturalist and iNaturalist itself without ID from other people will try to identify it or give a suggestion? Yeah, it, it will always try to offer a suggestion. Oh. Um, but yeah, I, and I think again, and I'm sure the other app probably has this problem is with some plants, like the difference is just so minute that just a leaf won't necessarily get it down beyond genus level. Yeah, right, right. So. Okay, thanks, yeah. Yeah, good to see you, Ted. Likewise, Brian. Okay, uh, one more question from Charles. Could iNaturalist be run like Pokemon Go to encourage participation uh, in our schools asking students to use the app? Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people who use it identify it as Pokemon Go, but with real Pokemon. Um, I, I, if you want to think about it that way, I encourage you to like to, to me and particular with like exploration green for a long time, I've held the lead on identifying species out there, but I have people like coming up behind me, grabbing at my shirt that, you know, they are uh, working on passing me up. So to me, this has become almost a competition in itself with, uh, some of my friends where we're trying to out ID each other as it were. Um, so yeah, like have fun with it. it. It is fun. Awesome. All right. Um, we are kind of butting up against our time limit here. Uh, so with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for being here, Brian. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Um, feel free to, we do kind of do, um, a general chat afterwards here in Zoom. So feel free to stick around if you want to just keep chatting and talking. Sure. Sure. All right. Before we have uh, one final song from JV Zay, uh, we are going to post a link to donate and sign up for our weekly newsletter in the chat window below here on in Zoom and on Facebook. While we're no longer meeting in a physical space, we uh, are still paying the musicians and still have some fixed expenses. So if you like what we're doing and, and you're able, please consider donating. With that, we'll have one final song from JV Zay. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> So I figured I'd do uh, another original. Uh, I know the past I've done mostly covers, so I figured this time I'd do my original stuff. Um, this last song I'm gonna do is called uh, What I Despise. This isn't where I want to be. 
Thank you so much. All right, thank you everyone for being here today. Special thank you to Brian and Jay. Um, we really appreciate y'all being here. Um, don't forget tonight, uh, tune in for another coronavirus conversation, 8 p.m. with Drs. Uh, Richard Andrews and Will Judy. Uh, we also have an upcoming volunteer event with the Houston Food Bank, Saturday, April 24th. So please check the email and Facebook for more information on that. And keep an eye out for our future emails, Facebook posts, meetup, However, keep in touch with us and have a great week.